Perfect. Marvelous. God is good. All the time. Hallelujah. Hey, you better listen closely because uh, it's going to be over before you, you, overthink, you think of it. Those of you who are visiting with us this morning, I really want to give you a personal invitation to come join us again on Sunday that's not Easter Sunday. You'll see kind of really what normal is and all that. But I can tell you right now that normal is a little longer than what it's going to be today. Just so you know. Uh, it's just the way it is. Hey, I want to give a happy rebirth uh, to someone special. Just a little shout out. I don't know what that means, but my wife handed me that note and said to say that. Now, if your wife hands you a note and she says to say this, you say it, right? Amen? You just do it. I'm kind of curious to get back to her later and find out. So what did that mean? I'm afraid she's going to say something like uh, she gets everything she wants to today or something. I don't know. Not exactly sure. Easter on April Fool's. I mean, when I, when I thought about that, seeing on the calendar that, that April Fool's was, that Easter was going to be on April Fool's Sunday, I thought right away, I was like, oh man, the, the sermon title just basically kind of jumped out, right? Don't be fooled. Because there's a lot of weird religions out there, a lot of weird stuff. Don't be fooled. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What makes it, makes it fundamentally, foundationally, the best, the most sure and true religion ever. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. I'd like to have you turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. We see an account here of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. This was a... On Easter morning, Easter morning, the, the ladies went to the tomb. So Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men clothed that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? <laughs> he is not here. He has risen. Amen. He is risen. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Now here's the thing. Even when Jesus told them that, do you realize what a weird story that was? So even though he's telling, telling it to them, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of evil men. He's going to be buried, and he's going to rise again. No doubt, even hearing that, they're going... Okay. You know, whenever Jesus was teaching them stuff, they probably didn't challenge too much. They just, okay. Not really want, knowing what you're really doing. It's kind of like when you're traveling someplace and you're lost and you just pull over and ask somebody for directions. They don't know where you're telling you to go. But they just don't want to seem stupid. So they, oh, no, I know. Yeah, go down here three blocks, take a right, and go down. And, and, you, and they're kind of nodding. They, okay, so I do go three blocks, take a right. and Yep, uh, okay. Do you remember when he was with you, he said, this, I must be delivered into the hands of sinners, crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Look at verse 11. But they did not believe the women. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense. They told them what they had. The tomb is empty. There's these, these two angels that showed up and they told us, why do you look for the living among the dead? And they're like, really? It was too good to be true. Or so they thought. 
Because they did not believe the women, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, bending over, saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Wondering to himself what had happened. Tell you what, I know they weren't celebrating April Fools back then, but no doubt all the apostles when Mary when the, the women came back and told them the story, if they were celebrating April Fools, they would have said, Ah, April Fools, you got us. But you know something? Don't be fooled. The tomb was empty. The body wasn't there. He is resurrected. He is risen. Indeed, hallelujah, make no mistake about it. You know, being fooled or being tricked is not fun. The whole idea of April Fool's Day is to try to give somebody a convincing story and hope they'll believe it. I look around our world today and I see that a lot of, the devil especially, is trying to trick a lot of people and April Fool's Day is every day of the week. Consider the Jehovah Witnesses. This week I had a flyer stuck in my door inviting me to go listen to a speech telling me who Jesus really was. And I already know what that speech is. That speech is going to declare that he was not the Son of God. He, he didn't resurrect from a physical body. Only his spirit resurrected from the dead. It was going to be a bunch of fools. The Jehovah Witnesses believe that the Trinity is demonic. That Jesus was nothing more than Michael, the archangel of the Old Testament. The worldwide church of God, the devil uses them to fool a lot of people too. Herbert Armstrong, they believe basically that salvation is attainable only by keeping all the commandments of God. I have to admit, I can't believe that even one person buys into that. But we serve an enemy who every day when he wakes up, it's April Fool's Day for him. He gets to wake up and try to trick people, try to fool people to believing a lie, trying to convince them that it's the truth. The Mormons. The Mormons believe that God at one time was a human living on the earth. He died, and while in that death state, he grew into his deified status that he has today as God the Father. They go on to say that we all contain the power to become gods, just like the Father God did. How's that working for you? It's like, I don't think I could try hard enough. Try to become God. Just think about it long enough, and stress over it. It's like, are you kidding me? Then we got Scientology, Tom Cruise's religion. The goal of Scientology is to eradicate the myths of traditional Christianity. Man is perfect. Jesus is not God. Heaven is a state of mind and hell is a myth. The devil is busy at work today. Busy at work. It has to be busy at work because you see, Christianity is the truth. And it has withstood the test of time. People have done all kinds of things to get rid of Christianity. They've tried to steal Bibles and take them away. They have tried to rob people of their faith. They have persecuted them. In fact, let's just go through the ABCs in acrostic fashion of what has happened to Christianity. Christianity has been abused. It's been badmouthed. It's been criminalized. It's been denied. It's been excluded. It's been fought against. It's been gagged. It's been hated. It's been inquisition. It's been jeered at. It's been kicked around. It's been loathed. It's been maligned. It's been neglected. It's been oppressed. It's been persecuted. It's been questioned. Are you following the ABCs there? Okay. I will. But because of the resurrection, it is real. It is superior. It is triumphant. It is universal. It is voluntary. It is wonderful. It is exhilarating. It is yearned for. It is the zenith of spirituality. You wondering what Z word I was going to use, didn't you? I can tell you the X was a lot harder. You see, the resurrection 
is the proof. A lot of people can make a lot of claims about a lot of things. You think about all the religions of the world, they're all making claims, but nobody makes a claim that not allowing death to hold them down, that death, the grave, could not keep them there, that they were resurrected from the dead. They're alive today. You go to Buddha's, ter- Buddha's ter- tomb, you can, you can go visit. It's, he's still there. All these other religions, there's only one claim to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 6, I love it. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing, he says, For I received, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first, first importance. Friends, this is fundamental to our faith. In fact, if people believe these things, that makes us brothers. That's why Catholics, we don't agree together with all the Catholic doctrines and some of the stuff that we we argue about. And we look at them and they go, I can't believe you believe that. And they look at some of our stuff and they go, I can't believe you believe that. But you know, as long as we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that makes us brothers. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. We are Christians together. I hand it over to you that which was first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Those three fundamental truths. And he appeared. Now here's the really neat thing. You know, the, some people said, oh, the, the soldiers, they stole his body. Really, well, he was quite alive and walking around. He was walking around, seen by many people. I mean, this was a myth that you could not keep under wraps because it's not a myth. It's true. That he appeared to to Peter, Cephas, to Peter, and then to to 12, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and the last of all, he appeared also to me as one abnormally born. It's really interesting. Jesus appeared to many people after he was resurrected. He didn't stay in that tomb. He didn't let people just think that his body was stolen. In fact, earlier that day, the women came. They wasn't there. They wasn't there. But there's the two men walking down the road of Emmaus. And Jesus started walking among them. And after he had left, he just kind of vanished. They looked at one another and says, When he was speaking, did your heart not burn? They remembered how Jesus used to speak to them. And their heart was stirred. And then he showed up in the room of the 12. He showed up a couple times because the first time Thomas wasn't there. Boo-hoo, Thomas. He was pouting. You all got to see him when I didn't. Mom, she's touching me. (laughs) You know, we really don't grow up that much, do we? So the second time Jesus shows up, he says, hey, here I am. Peace be with you. He said, Thomas, feel my hands, the holes in my hands and in my side. And then he appeared to 500 people at one time. At the writing of this, Paul says, most of them are still alive to this day. If you were to walk up and ask him, did you see Jesus? They'd say, yep, we did. He's alive. There was 500 people gathered on the the ascension at the time of the ascension. So as Jesus was there, and they saw him lifting up into heaven, I mean, what a day that would have been, huh? That would have been like, wow! But I can tell you a day that's even better. It's when he's coming back. Because then there's not going to be just 500. The Bible says every eye shall see him. Every eye. It's like he's coming back again. I mean, Jesus in John chapter 14 he says you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so would I have told you that I'd go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you I will come back to take you to be with me and the way that I'm going you know Thomas said Lord we don't know where you're going how can we know the way and Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life nobody comes to the father but by me can you imagine that 500 people gathered together it would be uh, about this many people right here. 
It'd be a gathering like this, or maybe just a tad bigger. Something like this, all together, looking at it. No, no, can I just tell you this? Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Just because it's April Fool's Day. Like I said, the devil, every day is April Fool's Day. I have heard sociologists describe the myth of the 500 witnesses of the ascension. You want to hear it? They believe, you know, the skeptics and the people that are trying to trick us, they, they said that there was a mass hypnosis. There was mass hypnosis. I tell you what, it takes more faith to believe that you could hypnotize 500 people at one time than that Jesus rose from the dead. I love that. Acts 111, Jesus is descending into heaven. And it says, in Acts 111, it says, Ye men of Galilee. Two, an angel shows up and says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which you saw leave, this same Jesus which you saw leave, shall return in like manner as you have seen him go. In other words, he's going to come back basically just like you saw him leave. He's going to appear in the clouds, in the skies. What a day that'll be, amen? I tell you what, don't be fooled. There's only one son, has, one God has been given, has gave his son so that we can be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation is found in no one else. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. For there is no name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. John 1, 12. To all who received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. Don't be fooled. There's only one name. 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has life. I know a lot of people, they don't want to surrender to Jesus Christ. See, that's the key. I want to have a little bit of this, and I want to have a little bit of this. You talk to people today, you witness to them, and talk, tell them about Jesus, and they'll tell you, it starts out something like this. Well, I believe, and you can see right away, because about what you're about ready to hear is a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of, um, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Scientology, a little bit of the fact that, you know, relativism, we get to make up our own rules as we go. Well, I believe, you know something? Don't be fooled. It doesn't matter what you believe because what you should believe is what's written in this book. Amen. Amen? John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You know, I think about the resurrection as the great proof, but you know, to me, the fact that the resurrection happened, I see in your life. The resurrection power residing in you is evidence that Christianity works. That Christianity is true. That there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. Because when you accepted Jesus, your life changed. I mean, I know some of you. I know some of you. You were scuzba. Your life was broken. It was shattered. You had no hope. You were going the way of the world, living like an animal, just kind of day to day, doing what seemed right. In the end thereof is a way of death. Your life was going down, going down the hill. It was going nowhere, and it was going there fast. I run into people all the time at the young age of 22. They've been in jail five times. They got kids by different ways. And I'm like, man, it's almost like you've been working at this to ruin your life. But you know something? Wherever Jesus is invited in, he changes everything. You see, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. And Christianity changes from the inside out. Every other religion tries to change the outside, convincing you that the inside's changed. No, see, Christ comes in and he works with the heart. He, takes, he begins with taking out the heart of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. Amen? Your life and my life is evidence that I'm not going to be fooled. Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the only way. Amen? Amen. Praise God. You know, this morning, we're going to celebrate communion together. I'd like to ask the, 
our servers to not only make ready, but take your positions. And while they're doing that, I want to just encourage you. There'll be some instructions up on the screen, but I want you to know if you're visiting with us, you do not need to be a member of Maranatha to have communion with us. We don't have wine for those that have had uh, some of those issues. We have grape juice. We do have a gluten-free station as well. That'll be right here in the front. But I do want to invite you to make Jesus Lord of your life. Friends, I don't want you to be fooled. There's no other way. There is no other way. Whether you're here for the first time or you've been coming forever and ever, wouldn't it be great if all of us just surrendered our life to the Lord afresh? Surrendered our life to the Lord anew? At this communion service, say, Jesus, I give you my life, and I take you into my life. I take what you did on Calvary and in the resurrection to be a part of my life. To celebrate Easter on just this one day would be pitifully ineffective. But the really cool thing about Easter is it's not just today. It's tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that. And when you look back at your life, you go, you know, when I get my, gave my life to Jesus, I really needed Jesus. But I find that I need him more today than I ever did because today's Easter again and again and again. Hallelujah. What I'd like to ask you to do, and I know that we have children with us. Uh, might be a little more...